All right, guys, welcome back to Lesson 82. Yes, Numbers 15 and 16. I mean, you think about yesterday's lesson. You know, everything was hinged on scouts. Everything was hinged on these men of God trusting and depending about what they've been hearing. And then they come back and they tell all the Israelites, hey, by the way, it's not going to work. And Joshua and Caleb said, that's just crazy. That's foolish. No, it, it's totally going to work. And yet what you see is, is because of 10 sc uh, scouts, 10 spies saying no, God decides to punish all of Israel. And all of Israel, we know, Kevin, what happens to them? They wander around in the desert for 40 years. Yeah, they wander around to their death. It's the worst protest and march ever, right? Walking to death. It's the walking dead is really what it is. Ooh. Ooh. Well, you're onto something now. I'm onto something. So anyway, because of that, only Joshua and Caleb and anybody under the age of 20 can now enter the promised land. And so now we're jumping into Numbers 15 and Numbers 16 today. That, that's the area progression of where we are at. Now, just because we've been talking about walking and all that stuff, I love this image about when you stand on the rock, and we know, Kevin, if you would, would you go to 1 Corinthians 10, 4? We know that when you stand on the rock, you're ultimately saying, I'm standing with, with Christ. It's a crazy cool picture in 1 Corinthians 10, 4 about our, our one word. Our one word is the rock. Jesus is the rock. And it says, and all drank the spiritual drink. For they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Joshua and Caleb, guess what? They depended upon the rock. The other 10 and all the Israelites, they didn't depend. And guess what happened? They didn't make it into the promised land. And so I just want to go back to like, look, when you depend upon his foundation, it works. We depend upon yours. You're wandering around for 40 years and it is not so fun. So in Numbers 15, it just says, hey, by the way, as you get ready to go into the land, but by the way, it's not going to be you. It's going to be your kids. It's kind of a weird, like he's giving instructions for people that can't even do this, you know, but you have to pass this down to kids. So it's kind of like stick it to you in a little bit. It is uh, heaping coals on their head. Yeah, it's totally heaping coals. So in Numbers 15, you really have laws about offerings. You know, when you enter the land, here's how I want you to do special offerings. I want you to do the, the wave offering. Remember, it talks about that in 17 through 21. Then it talks about unintentional sins in 22 through 29. What do you do with that? And then, you know, what do you talk about when people are despising the word? And what do you talk about the Sabbath? And there's a lot there. But the one part I, I don't want to miss is the tassels. I just think there's something here before we jump into number 16. And if you would, Kevin, would you go to verse uh, yeah, 38, speak to the Israelites and tell them that throughout their generations, they're to make tassels. Why? Because we have a bad memory. That's really what it's getting to. Make tassels for the corners of their garments and put a blue cord on the tassel at each corner. Verse 39, these will serve as tassels for you to look at so that as you're walking, as you're wandering, you remember that all the Lord's commands and obey them and not become unfaithful by following your own heart and your own eyes. In other words, what you've been doing for the last couple decades. I'm going to put blue tassels around for you to remember who I am. Scripture continues on in verse 40. This way you will remember and obey all my commands and be holy to you. So it's just a reminder. I mean, like, you know, some people put, you know, a, 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 a cross around their neck. That sounds silly for some, but it's a reminder. Some of you might have a keychain that has a Bible verse on it. Little reminders, and that's what the blue tassels are. Like, guys, it's apparent now you forget who I am. All right, so here's the backdrop. All right, now I want to say something. I think this is kind of cool. Uh, Sal Hummer. Okay, one of the commentators I've referenced before. Uh, it says, as, he wrote this, as the laws increase, okay, as more and more things that they have to do, and they constantly uh, grow, okay, so as the laws increase and constraints grow, excuse me, people seem less willing and capable of following them. So the more expectations that they have of his people, so the more that God gives people, sometimes it's harder to follow. Like, wait, did you just say Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Pentecost? You know, like, which, which ones? I mean, Kevin's already upped it up to 735, so that's apparent. So at this point, though, what happens is that the order, the whole order of the priesthood is thrown open to confrontation. In other words, everything is being challenged. And that's what we're going to see in number 16. They, they've had so many things that are continually being put on them, then a spirit of rebellion begins to take place. So in number 16, verse 1, it says, Now Korah, son of Ishar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, with Dathan and Abraham, okay, wow, here we go, sons of Eliab, and on, not off, but on, son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, wow, this is a lot, they took 250 prominent Israelite men who were leaders of the community and representatives in the assembly, and then it says they rebelled against Moses. Now, here's the crazy thing, okay, the Kohathites, okay, 
According to one commentator, okay, Wearsby, the Kohathites, their job was to carry the tabernacle furniture. So, like, these guys have an incredible job. Like, this is a big deal. And then they were camped out on the south side, which means they were going to be hanging out with the Gad and the, uh, and the Rubens and the Simeons, which I think is interesting why they picked these guys. So because of maybe where they're camped out and how they, they, they position themselves. And so the scriptures just say they grab 250 prominent men. They're just trying to find people quietly. And then eventually when they get everybody, like they're going to go against Moses. And so right away, I automatically, I think of Numbers 12. Do you guys remember who questioned Moses and Aaron's authority earlier? How about a family member? Miriam. Miriam. Miriam and Aaron both questioned and said, who are, you, who are you to say, Moses, that you're the only leader? And remember they attacked this marriage at first, like that was kind of their little angle. And then ultimately they just said, you know, we just don't think you're the guy. Well, that's ultimately what's happening again. And the only thing I can say is the more you hang out with bad people, it corrupts your uh, everything. All right, watch this. If you would go to 1 Corinthians 15, 33. You know, I think you say this to your kids. I think you'd say this to, you know, classmates if you're growing up in school or even, you know, obviously uh, even as adults. You know, it says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And this is what's happening. You have Korah hanging out with Dathan and Abraham and then these guys and on. And then they get 250 guys. And so then all of a sudden everything begins to change. You know, we don't, we don't really like Moses's opinion. We don't really like that he's imposing in Aaron all these rules and regulations. And Proverbs 13, 20, if you'll go there as well, Kevin, just kind of proves the point. The more times you hang out with people that are like-minded like you, it just, it doesn't end well. The one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. I think this verse right here is prophetic. This verse is just saying, okay, fine. You want to hang out with these guys, uh, Korah? You want to hang out with these guys, Datham and Abraham on 250? Scripture just says you're going to experience and suffer harm. And that's exactly what happened. Watch as this thing unfolds. Verse 3, they came together against Moses and Aaron and told them, you've gone too far, Moses. Everyone in the entire community is holy. <laughs> and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the Lord's assembly? In other words, who gave you the right to say you're holy and we're not? Can, Kevin, can you go to Exodus 19, verse 5? You know, interesting enough, they have somewhat of a point. Okay, I'm just going to go here for a second. You know, if you'll remember me, remember those three words that the Israelites are described as. It says, you'll be my own possession. You're my special treasures out of all the peoples, although all the earth is mine. In verse 6, it says, and you'll be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you say to the Israelites. So in their mind, they're special. They are the kingdom of priests and they're a holy nation. And so they, they know what they're doing, but they're using these words to say, hey, I, isn't everybody holy? Didn't, didn't God say all of us, we should be in the same, the same boat? But the reality is, is that people, like if there's not somebody in charge, you don't have infrastructure. I think here's the point. People always try to, to, to buck the system. They always try to say, oh, why is this guy in charge? But the reality is you need somebody. You need somebody to be in charge. I mean, think about the structure of Romans 13.1. Kevin, will you go there? Romans 13, 1, how many people always complain about the government? It doesn't matter if it's Obama or Trump. It doesn't matter. People, somebody is complaining about something. But if you don't have somebody in authority, everyone must submit to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist, watch that, look at that, are instituted by God. God puts these people in authority because there's structure, there's order in all of this. I mean, think about families. All I can tell you is this, is that like the infrastructure for families are important to the kids who knew to, to report to. I mean, I, I know that sounds silly, but because of that, then we then represent who Christ is in our lives. And so these guys, Korah, Datham, Abraham, on 250 are challenging the system. And in verse four, this is what happens. It says that when Moses heard this, look what he does. He fell face down. There's, there's not even a rebuttal. Like, I mean, it, the reality is God's speaking to Moses through all this time. I mean, and these guys come up and like, I mean, he's not, he's not speaking to these guys. He's speaking to Moses, but Moses didn't say anything. Just proves the point that he is humble. You know, think about, um, there's, there's multiple Absalom when he was defying his father. He, he wanted a new position, as it says in, in 2 Samuel. Adonijah, he was claiming to be uh, in a position in 1 Kings. And then the story in Luke 22, we know this, the disciples. Hey, hey which one is the greatest? And I, I just think that it's part of our nature. 
All of us have it somewhat in us. And I love how Moses responds. He just falls on his face. And in verse five, it says, then he said to Korah and all his followers after he'd already fallen on his face. This is his response. Tomorrow morning, the Lord will reveal who belongs to him, who is set apart and the one who he will let come near him. He will let the one he chooses come near him. I, I love this. Verse six, Korah, you and your followers, you're to do this. Now, just real quick before we keep going to the fire pans. But I love what Moses does here is he just says, let the Lord decide. He's so confident in who he is in the Lord. He has nothing to prove. And I, you know, I have to tell you, it seems like more and more in the Christian industry, and I say that for a reason, it feels like people are trying to always prove themselves. Like, hey, have you seen this book and this book and this book? And have you tried this, this, and this? And Moses is like, you know, whatever. The Lord's hand is on this. It's fine. You do your thing. I'll do my thing. And then we'll just see who the Lord shows up and blesses. So I want you, it says in verse six, take your fire pans. And then it says this, and tomorrow, keep going, Kevin, if you would. I want you to place, place your fire pans in, uh, put your fire in them, place fire in them and put incense on them before the Lord. Then the man who the Lord chooses will be the one who set apart. It is you Levites who have gone too far. Remember the whole deal about the incense and fire with Nadab and Abihu? Oh Lord, we're pretty sure that that didn't end well. They brought the wrong incense, the wrong fire, and oh, by the wrong, with the wrong people in the wrong time. And so if I'm, if I'm Moses, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty confident this is going to work out well for me. <laughs> and I think this is how Jesus, you guys, this is how Jesus responds. When people question him, he handles it just like, just like Moses. He's a rock. He's not phased. Nothing is, uh, is coming at him. And he's like, oh, no. In fact, Kevin, can you go to 1 Peter 2, 23? And I, I love these images. Scripture says this, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he was suffering, he didn't threaten but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Isn't that an awesome passage? Isn't this a great picture about how Moses handles himself? Jesus does as well. <laughs> well, I'm not going to come back at you. I'm suffering, but I'm not going to threaten you. In fact, remember the whole uh, cutting off the ear? No, guys, not, not, not the right time. Can you go to Luke, Kevin, if you would? Luke 22, verse 42. You know, Father, he says, if you're willing, take this cup away from me. But watch what he does. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I'm pretty sure Moses didn't want to experience this with all these guys. I'm pretty sure Jesus didn't want to experience this, but you know what Jesus did? This is not my decision. It's not my will. It's yours. And I think sometimes when people push your buttons, you know, I, I had a phone call last week with a gentleman that really had had issues with me for the last couple of years. Uh, it was somebody that we have done ministry with in another state. And here we are a couple of years later, I'm readdressing issues that he had had with me. You know, naturally you would want to get defensive. Naturally you'd want to say this, this, and this, but you know, it, it is what it is. You let the Lord decide on how this thing unfolds. It's exactly what Moses does. In verse eight of Numbers 16, if you would, Kevin, Moses also told Korah, now, now listen, Levites, isn't it enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the Israelite community to bring you near to himself. In other words, I've already given you, Korah, what are you, what are you guys talking about? God's already given you a distinct place amongst the Israelites. And he says, I've separated you from the Israelite community to bring you near to himself, to perform the work at the Lord's tabernacle and to stand before the community to minister to them. In other words, isn't this enough already? And then it says on in verse 10, he's brought near you near and all you fellow Levites who are with you, but you're seeking the priesthood as well. It's like, why can't you just be content with the, the Levitical, uh, the role? And why do you have to have more? It's crazy to me. Scripture says then, therefore, it is you and all your followers who have conspired against the Lord. Whew. You want a position because you want more. You're not satisfied with just this one role. He says, but you're seeking the priesthood as well. Therefore, it is you and all your followers who have conspired against the Lord. As for Aaron, who is he that you should complain about him? Like, why, why, are, you, why are you throwing Aaron into this? The reality is, is that Moses was a hated individual. They didn't like Moses. They didn't like Aaron. And I'm telling you, when you do the Lord's work, whether you're building the tabernacle where you're, you're the priest inside the Holy of Holies and you're lighting the menorah, lighting the candle, whatever role it is, because God's hand is on you, you should fully expect, you ready for this, to be hated. You should fully expect that people, people aren't going to like you. I was going to say, it probably wouldn't have mattered who was in that position. It was the fact that they weren't in that position. That's right. I don't know. Maybe somebody listening, that's you. 
Maybe you're always trying to position yourself because you think that you're going to get more approval from people because of the way you're seen or the role that you have. It really has nothing to do with our roles. It has everything to do with obedience. Now watch. It says in 1 John 3, 12, unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Watch. Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. So his brother was hated because of his righteous way of living, his righteous acts. He was hated. Now here, here's more. Genesis 37, verse 4. Genesis 37, verse 4, it talks about, again, you should expect as you walk in righteousness, walk in holiness, people are not going to like you. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring him themselves to speak peaceably to him. So here's the deal, you guys. You should actually get excited when people don't like you. Obviously because of righteousness, not because like if you like the Pittsburgh Steelers and they hate you, that's just fleshly and they should all like the Pittsburgh Steelers. But the point is this, is that when people have a hard time with you because you're walk with the Lord, you should rejoice because you're reflecting the Messiah. Scripture also says in John 15, verse 18, let's just go there about Jesus himself. John 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. In other words, you'd actually find approval. However, because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it. The world hates you. I don't know, when I see this whole image of, of Moses and how he acts, it then points obviously to the rock. It points obviously to the Messiah and how Jesus interacted. And I feel like kind of this is a little bit more of a somber tone because I think sometimes we're always trying to position ourselves for more. And I think if you take the opposite, Mark 10, 45, if you come to serve, that's when he elevates you. That's when he exalts you. And it's a biblical way to move forward in the world. Humble yourself and he will exalt you. And now watch, look at the arrogance in verse 12. I'm in number 16. The arrogance is so ridiculous. It says, Moses sent for Dathan and Abraham, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we're not coming out. We're not leaving our room. We won't come. I mean, what a, get over yourself. What do you mean you won't come and talk to Moses? Is it not enough that you brought us up, they say, from a land flowing with milk and honey? Like, like Egypt was flowing with milk and honey, right? I don't know where they're coming up with all this stuff. To kill us in the wilderness? Do you also now have to appoint yourself as a ruler over us? And by the way, it wasn't Moses. It was the Lord that appointed him. And furthermore, you didn't bring us to a land flowing of milk and honey. Like, I don't see it anywhere, they complain. Or give us an inheritance of the fields and vineyards. Will you gouge out the eyes of these men? Oh, by the way, we ain't coming. <sighs> then Moses, humility time's over. <laughs> <laughs> Moses became angry and he said to the Lord, don't respect their offering. I haven't taken one donkey from them. I love that. I haven't taken any bribe from them or mistreated a single one of them. So Moses told Korah, you and your followers are to appear before the Lord tomorrow. You, they, and Aaron, I'm telling you, it is game on. You want to play this game? And he says, each of you is to bring your fire pan, place incense on it, present his fire pan before the Lord. 250 fire pans. That's <laughs> an awesome picture here. You and Aaron are each to present your fire pan also. Each man, it says in verse 18, they took his fire pan and they placed fire in it. They put incense on it. They stood at the entrance to the tent of the meeting along with Moses and Aaron. Now after Korah assembled the whole community against them at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. In other words, everybody's watching. It was like the Olympics of the Olympics. Everybody in that nation was watching. And the glory of the Lord appeared to the whole community. It says in verse 20, here comes the judgment. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, verse 21. Separate yourselves. Remember, Moses and Aaron, now, now I need you to move because I'm going to consume them instantly. And, and by the words, I'm going to destroy them. I would back up because if you don't like the smell of singed hair, you should probably leave. Back away, I'm bringing the fire. But Moses and Aaron, again, they fall face down. They say, God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when, when one man sins, Will you vent your wrath on the whole community just because of these 250, just because of Korah and Dotham and, and all these other guys and on, just because of this? Are you going to really wipe out everything? Again, they fall on their face and they cry out to the Lord. You know, I, ju I just want to just scream out, Lord, forgive us because we have homosexuality running rampant in the United States. Like you guys, we're watching the Olympics at times. And when people come down the hills, the American flag that has stood a test of time that represents people shedding their blood for us, they now have a gay pride flag on there saying this is America. 
And instead of getting angry, we have to fall on our face and say, God, please spare us. Don't wipe out our nation because of these people flaunting their sin. It's exactly what Moses and Aaron do. They don't get mad. They fall on their face. And because of that, the Lord replied to them. He says, you tell the community to get away. Fine. Okay, I, I hear your prayers. You tell the people to get away from all of these rebellious people. Get away from the dwellings of Korah and Dotham and Abraham. Get them away. And Moses got up. He went to Dotham. He went to Abraham. He went to the elders of Israel that followed him. And he warned everybody, please, you guys, get away from the tents of these wicked people. Don't touch them. They are un." clean, that belongs to them, you will be swept away because of all their sins. If you associate yourself, bad company member will lead to harm. If you hang out with these people, you will experience the wrath of God. And so praise the Lord, people, they got away. Oh yeah, don't know those guys. Well, see you later. <laughs> they got away from the dwellings of Korah and Dotham and Abraham. And meanwhile, Dotham and Abraham, they came out and they stood at the entrance. And here's where you just feel horrible. Their wives, their children, the infants, and then Moses says this, this is how you'll know that the Lord sent me to do all these things and it was not of my own will. Verse 29, if these men die naturally, in other words, if they're just hanging out and they die because, oh yeah, cold. <laughs> but if these men die naturally as all people would and suffer the fate of all, then the Lord has, hasn't sent me. But this is how you're going to know in verse 30. But if the Lord brings about something unprecedented and the ground opens its mouth and then oh, swallows them all along, along with all that belongs to them, so that they go down al alive into Sheol, then you will know that these men have despised the Lord. Now, this is one of the most crazy pictures ever. In verse 31, watch this, just as he finished speaking all these words, the ground beneath them split open. Now, multiple times, you guys, we, we've seen ground splitting open in Scripture. Kevin, if you would, can you go to 1 Samuel 14, verse 15? It says, tear spread through the Philistine camp and the open fields to all the troops. Even the garrison and the raiding parties were terrified. Watch this. The earth shook and terror spread from God. Uh, they say now roughly 200 to 300 tremors a day take place in Israel. Minor. Like people don't even know that these tremors are always taking place. Uh, there's another one. 1 Kings 19.11. 1 Kings 19.11. So like when the ground shook and God revealed his presence, this wasn't actually... Uh, that abnormal. It says, at that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake because the Lord spoke differently in another way. But the point is, is that here you see over and over again, God, God can use earthquakes. God can use whatever uh, physical means, clouds, fire, uh, lightning, thunder, earthquake to do whatever he wants to do. And it says this in verse uh, 31, it says, The ground beneath them split open. The earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them and their households and all quarters people and all their possessions. Kevin, if you would, can you go to Jude 1 verse 11? And it, it lumps in Korah with Cain and Balaam. It's kind of an interesting mentality. Woe to them, for they have traveled all in the way of Cain. For they have abandoned themselves to the heir of Balaam for profit and have perished in Korah's rebellion. This rebellion... And the 250 folks, you guys, this is known as one of the ultimate rebellious groups in all of the Old Testament. And guess what? They got swallowed up in an earthquake. <laughs> and they went down alive into Sheol with all that belonged. The earth closed over them and they vanished from the assembly. Wow. And all along, Moses just said, yeah, go ahead. Just let's see who the Lord shows up with. Let's see who the Lord chooses. And at their cries in verse 34, all the people of Israel who were around them fled because they thought the, the earth is going to swallow us up too. And then fire also came from the Lord and then consumed the 250 men who were presenting the incense. I don't know about you, but I don't really want to fall into the hands of an angry God. Okay, can you go to Hebrews 10 verse 31? And scripture just says this, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is exactly what happened to these guys. They pushed the envelope, they questioned the anointed, they questioned the leadership of Moses and Aaron, and guess what? They are all dead. Verse 36, then the Lord spoke to Moses. I'm back in number 16. Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, I want you to gather all the fire pans. I want you to keep them. I want you to put everything together because they're holy. I want you to make this and hammer them into plating for the altar. 
And then in verse 40, it says, just as the Lord commanded him. It was to be a reminder for the Israelites that no unauthorized person outside the lineage of Aaron should approach to offer incense before the Lord and become like Korah and his followers. In other words, it's not for them to use the fire pans. It's not up for them to use the incense. No, no, no. It's only those that God has chosen. Looks like they would have paid attention to what happened to Aaron's other sons when they didn't use the fire, right? You'd think they'd figure it out. 250 of them now this time. No, it doesn't happen, which is why they have the blue tassels. And apparently the blue tassels down the road, they're going to come in handy because they still didn't have the blue tassels. They said, when you get into the land. And the craziest thing, you guys, in verse 41, look at this. The entire Israelite community complained and said, you just killed the Lord's people. Hey, Moses, hey, Aaron, uh, you, just, you just killed all of these people. But there was no fear of God in their eyes, Scripture says. Moses knew the ways of the Lord, but the Israelites did not. So after the people challenged Moses and said, you killed him, Moses and Aaron, they went to the front of the tent of the meeting. And in verse 44, God and Moses had a dialogue. And God very clearly said, I want you to get away from this community because I'm going to consume them instantly. And then what do you know? The track record is we know this. <laughs> Moses and Aaron, even though they just got accused of killing, they fell again face down. Moses and Aaron's heart, you guys, is to intercede on behalf of the people, even though they keep coming at them, even though they keep giving them problems, like over and over. It's this humility of this leadership that I just want to say, guys, I hope we all live like this. And you got to understand this. In verse 46, Moses and Aaron, they come up with a game plan. Take your fire pan, place the fire in it, and I want you to add incense. Now, here's the deal, Aaron. I need you to act as an intercessor on behalf of all this community because God's going to bring something to this community, and we got to get them to stop. So he said, I want you to run quickly. Go quickly into the community. I want you to make atonement. Aaron, you got to run into the middle of the camp. Wrath is coming from the Lord. The plague is beginning to take place. And so Aaron doesn't even question this. He grabs his fire pan, just as Moses. He ran into the middle of the assembly. He saw that the plague had begun. Thousands of people were already dying. God was going to bring out the wrath of God on these people. And then he began to add incense. He made atonement for the people. And then it says he stood in verse 48 between the dead and the living. Aaron stood amidst all of the people who didn't want anything to do with Aaron or Moses. They questioned him. And it says the plague halted. Aaron was the intercessor. Aaron stood up. Aaron was willing to demonstrate his own love to go amidst the plague, to take his own life so that everything would stop. But unfortunately, already 14,700 people had died. And I am convinced more and more would have died if Aaron and Moses didn't come up with a game plan to say, Aaron, I need you to go in and act as an atonement, almost to that extent, through the incense. I need you to stop this plague. Aaron then returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent since the plague had been halted. All I can see is Aaron's running into the middle of all of this, this plague, running into the middle of all of this sin. I just see the same as Jesus. Jesus just runs right into the middle of our camp. Even Ezekiel 22, verse 30, it says the same. You guys, there's this picture of that we need somebody to stand on behalf of our gap. Ezekiel 22, verse 30, I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap for, before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it, but I found no one. You know, I, I believe that uh, Aaron was that person in the gap. Jesus becomes that person in the gap. As crazy as their complaints against Moses, as crazy as the complaints are against Aaron, God was ready to wipe him out multiple times. I love that Aaron runs into the middle, the middle of everything to stop the craziness. That's exactly what Jesus does for us. That's the end of lesson 82, numbers 15 and 16. Hope you'll join us tomorrow. Thanks.